أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين إن شاء الله going to talk about the dua and before I do that I'll just mention a few things uh, about the idea of coming together to honor the sunnah and the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a few things that uh, should be taken with uh, what the Arabs would say be sadr and rahim like with an open breath the first thing is that in a, a group like this as, as small as we are I think it would probably be nicer to have a less formalized setting I think the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what I what I understand from his sunnah is that he, he did not like tekendof at all what's called tekendof he liked things to be as natural as possible in fact a very fascinating hadith for me is a hadith that's related in Sahih Muslim that he passed by some people that were uh, fecundating date palms, date trees and he stopped and he looked at them and he thought it was very strange um, and this is something in Medina because he was from Mecca and they didn't have date palms in Mecca and he saw the Ansar doing this and he thought it was strange and he made a comment and so they didn't actually pollinate that year and they had a very bad crop and the Prophet, they came to the Prophet and they, they told him what had happened and he said don't antum adra bi dunyakum you know better about your dunya than me in other words I'm not a date palm fecundator <laughs> that's not his job and so the fact that he made a comment about it really should uh, be taken in that light that that is not his area what Ibn Khaldun عنه, said is that the Prophet him, in his chapter on medicine in the Muqaddimah he says that the Prophet وسلم, said uh, did not come as a doctor a tabib like with knowledge of medicine with uh, the knowledge of anatomy and physiology and these types of things that is not his role and although there's some extraordinary hadith that would indicate that he had a deep knowledge of those matters for example when he finished his fast he used to say and this is a dua ذهب الظم وابتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله the thirst is gone and the, he said وابتلت العروق the, the, the veins have been quenched or soaked وابتلت the idea of being completely uh, soaked in. Now if you, if you look from a physiological point of view, the reason he broke dates uh, with dates is because dates are natural sugar. In fact, they're basically it's a fructose, which is a simple sugar, and it breaks down almost immediately in the stomach. If you chew it well and you actually uh, ingest it, within a few seconds, it will, in fact, you can take a, a, a glucose monitor that diabetics use and before you break the fast and then do it immediately after with dates and do a stick and you will see a rise in the blood sugar instantaneously and that's an indication that it's gone through all the veins because it reaches you know the tips of the fingers and so the veins literally have been soaked after you break the fast and, and that's a deep physiological awareness but the point Ibn Khaldun makes is that that is not why he came that is not what his message is to people but he said but he laid down principles of medicine which is important to understand in other words the Prophet ﷺ gave us principles now what I see from that hadith about the palm tree is that the Prophet ﷺ, it was an unnatural thing to have to uh, pollinate for the humans to intervene in something that is natural but at the same time and I think that's what the Prophet ﷺ was looking at 
was that, it, that there was a, a human element there that just seemed odd that it should be there. But at the same time, Allah uses bees to pollinate the flowers and Allah uses uh, the winds to pollinate uh, the uh, flora of the earth. So there's means, even pollination has means and that's what those people are, they're means. But the point of that is that he did not like unnatural things. And I think one of the things uh, in, in a modern situation, if you look at traditional Muslim cities from aerial views, it's very fascinating because what they look like is a cell. They look like a biological cell. If you look, when you fly in the United States, if you fly across this country, what you see is square patches everywhere. And it looks literally like an engineer went crazy on the earth because it's just straight lines everywhere. And if you go do the same thing and fly over a Muslim farmland in traditional Muslim farming techniques, you don't see these squares. You see very natural borders. Maybe he got tired and just decided to stop wherever he got to and, and so it's, and it's very natural. And the same with Muslim streets. If you go into traditional Muslim cities, the streets are all windy and they're not straight thoroughfares. Like in America, they like things to be efficient, right? This is the most important thing in American society, is to be efficient. And even to be efficient to the point where humans don't matter. If it's going to be efficient at the cost of being humane, they will choose efficiency over humanity. And this is, uh, this is kufa, this is the nature of kufa, is that it will choose an unnatural way. And when I say unnatural, I mean it's, it's anti-biological. In fact, there are medicines based on something called antibiotic, which means against life. And, and so th this is the philosophy of the people that we're dealing with. And so I really think um, the, the idea of, of straight rows in the prayer is, is very interesting because before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're completely equal. And that's what straight rows do, they're equalizers. Whereas in the worldly affairs, if things are allowed to happen naturally, you will find, for instance, in cream, that it rises to the top. But here they like to homogenize milk. You know what homogenized milk is? it means the cream doesn't rise to the top. You see, that's what homogenized milk is. And that's exactly what this culture does. It homogenizes people so that the cream is never allowed to rise to the top. In fact, what happens is scum rises to the top. And I was saying today about, you know, that, that in Muslim countries, you reflect on the, your rulers as as really mirrors to look at yourself, because that's what rulers are. And I think, I mean, it's pretty scary if Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton are the mirrors of the American society. And even more scary is that we're here. And so it has a meaning for us as well, not just for Joe American down the road. It has a meaning for us as well. And so the point of that being is that I hope that this uh, these two days are days that aren't just uh, rhetoric about the seerah, but are a display of the adab of the Prophet ﷺ and the adab of especially looking after our older people and an awareness that, for instance, that the Prophet ﷺ used to actually prefer them in terms of sitting and in terms of uh, helping them, like when Abu Bakr brought his father radiallahu anhu to the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet said, why didn't you tell me and I would have gone to him. And this is the adab of the Prophet because the Prophet certainly is much greater than the father of Abu Bakr, but he's displaying his, uh, his sunnah which is to show compassion, mercy and respect to older people. And uh, also in the adab with the women, you know, that when there's, I mean, I believe in that the deen of Islam is a middle way. I think that absolute 
segregation of hiding an element of the society away is unhealthy, but at the same time I think that it's healthy where you don't have barriers and adab, because hijab means barrier in the Arabic language. And it's a barrier between a woman's uh, outwardness and, and the society at large. And so the hijab is to allow her to go out into the society with respect. And so the hijab has to be honored. And, th and that's an important uh, thing also. So uh, we, we have to be very careful about those things. And another thing, I'm horrified of the idea of a theater conference and having donuts for breakfast. And what I tend to like to do, and I'm not, I'm really serious about this, what I tend to like to do is I like to see when I want to do something, and, and one of the greatest criterion that I've ever seen for anything came from Imam Madik, when he was asked about chess, shatranj, and they had chess at that time. It, there's no hadith about chess. All these, there's had, because see, people started playing chess when they, when the Muslims went to Persia, the Persians were chess players. In fact, it's all about Persian pieces. They weren't, the Christians took it, but it was originally the Shah. You see, you say checkmate. It used to be Shah Mat. The Shah is dead. Right? So the, the check was actually the Shah. Right? And, and so it was originally the Persians. In fact, uh, according to Amir al-Bukhari Jazari, in a book I read, although some people say chess is originally from India, um, in his book, he says that it was a Persian scholar that actually invented chess. But the point is, is that there's all these hadiths about how evil chess is. They're all invented hadiths because, unfortunately, good-hearted people with uh, a poor understanding of Islam saw everybody playing chess, so they started saying, the only thing they'll listen to is the Prophet's life and the good old days, right? when people actually did take heed to the hadith. And so they started inventing all these hadiths about whoever plays chess at night, you know, wakes up cursed and whatever they are. But Imam Malik was asked about chess and he said, Amin al haqqi huwa? Is it from haqq? In other words, is it from truth? And, and, and the man said, La Allahi. Right? It's not from haqq. I mean, he couldn't say that chess was from haqq. So he said, Wa hal ba'd al haqqi illa balal? You know, is there anything after haq except balal? And that is a beautiful criterion. You just take things in your life, the television, and just say, Amin al haqqi huwa? You know, is it something from haq? And then just apply the second part to it. Wa hal ba'd al haqqi illa balal? And then you have a wonderful criterion for living your life. Which doesn't mean, Qad Ayyab, for instance, said that if you play chess, um, to to develop the mind for strategy and things like that and don't waste your time. In other words, don't, like some people play computer games for hours. Right? And um, I deleted them off my computer because I don't even want the temptation. That's how weak I am. But um, then you're in another, you have another problem. So he said, for instance, if you play it and the time of prayer goes past and you ignore it, then, then you have a problem. So I think that's important to look at that criterion and use that criterion for our things. So that's my few remarks, or not so few remarks, to begin. And uh, just to talk a little bit about dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran um, that, Ad'uni astajib lakum, that if you call on me, I will answer you. Now dua, da'a, in the Arabic language, literally means to invite. You're inviting. If I say da'autuhu, it means I invited him. Da'autuhu ala bayti, for instance. I invited him to my house. So dua is an invitation. Now what it is when you make dua to Allah, you are asking Allah. It's a supplication. You are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help or for whatever. Now there's a, a secret, and a lot of people uh, misunderstand this, but there is a beautiful hadith that says, من شغله ذكري عن مسألتي عطيته أكبر مما عطيت السائلين. Whoever is so preoccupied with my remembrance uh, that he doesn't ask me for anything, I will give him more than what I give those who ask me. 
Now that is a very powerful statement. And the reason it is, is because what dua really is, is it is a, an expression of our ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, it is the slave who asks. And yet, we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our needs. You, when you ask Allah, you cannot think that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something that he is not aware of. Because that is ignorance. In other words, if you, oh Allah, I'm having a terrible time. If you are truly having a terrible time, Allah is more aware of that fact than you are. And so you don't need to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that. So what dua really is, is it is a manifestation before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of one's helplessness in front of Allah. Now the Prophet ﷺ, there are there's du'as in the Quran that are very interesting, like Zakaria's du'a about la tadarni fardan, you know, uh, don't leave me without child. Now Zakaria ﷺ did not have child and his wife was um, barren and Allah says aflahnaha that he rectified uh, whatever her weakness was and, and, and she became pregnant with uh, Yahya. So that, that is an extraordinary thing because that is a prophet asking for a child. Now the prophet knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he doesn't need to ask. So what that is, is it is a manifestation of his ubudiyah before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how the prophets ask. When Omar radiallahu anhu went on the hajj uh, to make umrah actually, the prophet وسلم, said, اذكرني عند ربك يا أخيّة. And Umar said, Wallahi, those words were more precious to me than this world and everything in it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Or sharikni fi du'aika. Remember me in your du'a, O my little brother. Now, what Ahmad Zarruq says, عنه, is in no way is the Prophet ﷺ in need of Umar's du'a. But what he is doing is he is making a sunnah for his ummah. And the sunnah is that you, you ask your brother or your sister to remember you in their prayer. Now the beauty of ask, it's better to ask for other people than it is to ask for yourself. And the reason for that is, is because you know, what you're doing is you're attempting to, you're thinking about somebody else's trouble and not about your own. And that is a much higher thing to be concerned with your own problem. So when you ask for another person, the beauty of it is, and this is the wondrous uh, thing about the sunnah of Allah, is that not only do, do you get help for them, but Allah gives you whatever you ask for them. Now at the same time, the Prophet said uh, to, uh, that, you know, that it's important to ask before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that dua should always be with that understanding that what we are doing is manifesting our slavehood before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also that to do remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without asking Him is actually a higher thing. It's a, it is actually a higher thing to be occupied with the, the uh, dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now another wonderful thing about the dua is that we have in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu all of these du'a, and what really what that what these du'as are, again it's a manifestation of the ubudiyah to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But what what they are is they are ways of literally waking up and becoming a conscious person. In other words, that you begin to do your actions as a conscious human being, as opposed to being a sleepwalker, which is certainly the state of the vast majority of people. People are asleep and when they die they wake up. And the Prophet said, Hasibu qablan tu hasibu. That you should uh, have your day of reckoning before the day of reckoning. And he said, In Sahih Muslim, Uddu anfusukum min ashab al qubur. Consider yourselves like people already in their graves. And what this means is, wake up before you die. And part of the process of waking up is becoming conscious of your actions. In other words, most people, uh, and, and 
there are different degrees of this, but most people literally go through their lives in, uh, on what they call like in uh, technology automatic pilot. considerably, usually um, the third portion of the night. So he, he used to um, sleep one-third or two-thirds of the night and, and be up either two-thirds or one-third of the night. But Nafida was wajiba for him. The original prayer in Mecca was night prayers. They did not pray the five prayers. They actually prayed night prayers, which is really interesting. That that, that was the original. That was what was fard on them in the Surat al-Muzammil, Ya al muzammil uh, the command that is the command to do nafira in the night and he and his sahaba used to do nafira every night but at that time it was fard when they get to Medina it becomes nafira and so this and then he would the, the he would say alhamdulillah ahyani ba'dama amatani wa ilayhi nushur and the first thing he would say, glory to the one or praise be to the one who has brought me back to life. Because de the sleep is called Akhul Maut or uh, al Maut, the little brother of death. Because it's a type of death. And so the first thing he would do was make mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had raised him from the, from, the, uh, from the dead and brought him back to life. And in Andalusia there was one uh, scholar who actually had a, um, a, he had a, a grave built uh, inside his room um, and he used to get into it at night. I mean, I don't recommend this uh, people, but it's interesting what they did, you know, to try to wake up. But he used to get down into this and he would close his eyes and imagine that he was dead and that people were, had prayed on him. And then he would, he would say, uh, Rabbi uh, Arjani Amal Oh Allah, make me return so I can do righteous deeds. And then he would open his eyes and say, Alhamdulillah, you know that Allah has allowed me to come back. And then that's how he would begin his day. So that puts you in a good mood to do righteous deeds. And that's why the Prophet said, Akhiru min dhikri hadam al Do much remembrance of the destroyer of pleasure, which is death. And so, when you wake up, that's the first thing that should come to mind. Is and and I and I am ass, I'm assuming, you know, that people are getting up for fajr. I mean, that's just that's a given for Muslims. That's not. I mean, there's no excuse for for not praying fajr. There's no excuse at all. Um, if I mean, if we're not doing fajr, we just forget it. We don't have anything before Allah. The day is just, it's, it's really not. That, that's the way we begin the day. Is It's not tahajjud, which is the preferable way. At least fajr in its time. And um, then the Prophet Wasallam would make du'as when he dressed. And he would dress a certain way. You see, he would he put his sirwal, if he wore sirwal, he would always put them sitting on the floor. He did not put his sirwal on standing up. He would actually sit down and put them on sitting on the floor. He tied his turban a certain way. He actually, he went, taqweer of his turban went from right to left. Very interesting. Same way that you go around the Kaaba. Now, all those things have meaning, there's no doubt, because this is the process of becoming awake, an awakened human being. And then he had a dua when he went out the door, for instance, when he ate, if he had breakfast or fasting, whatever. He had a dua for going out the door. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ubinda aw udal, aw azinda aw uzal, aw adhrima aw uzram, aw ajhal aw yajhal alayya. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you that I should go astray or be led astray, that I should slip or be tripped, that I should um, show ignorance to anyone or somebody shows ignorance to me. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing to say when you go out. Because, and then, to وَكَلْتُ عَلَى اللَّهِ I trust in Allah. And so what you're doing by going out with that, you are going out first in, in a protection of Allah. Because now you've entered into what's called فِي ذِمَّةِ 
you've entered into the zimma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, you sought refuge in Allah from doing these things. And if you did them with a, a, a heart that's present, then you should expect that you are in the zimma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hold that expectation. Wallahu fi husni ghani abdihi. Allah is in the good opinion of his slaves. And then he said certain du'as every morning. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika a'udhu bika rimati la'i tam mati min sharri ma kharaq. And he would say that three times. I seek refuge in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from every evil that he has created. And then he would say, If you don't know these things um, and you're over 12, I'm deeply disappointed because these are things all every Muslim should know. I mean, these are just real basic surat. Uh, if you're a new Muslim, then that's another matter. But if, if you're coming from a Muslim country in particular, I mean, the fact that you weren't taught these things is a shame. That, that is a shame. Because these were some of the first things that, that I was taught. You know, that I was taught. We have, in fact, subhanAllah, one of the last things my Quran teacher said to me when I left, uh, and he's a faqih and a, a good scholar, Sheikh Hamid Ahmad al Wali, and he's a Mauritanian scholar, and he said to me when I went, was coming to America, he said, Usika and taqula kulla sabah wa masa. That's what he told me. He said, my advice to you, since you're going to America, to say those two things every day and just hold to those and don't, don't stop saying them because they're a protection from bad things. And, um, and then also uh, when he went into the souk, he had a dua, and he used to go into the suq. He said, don't be the first into the suq, and don't be the last one out. Right? And there's a hadith that says, this is why living here is kind of frightening, because there's a hadith that said, they said, أَبْغَضُ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ The worst places to Allah, the worst places, the lands to Allah, are the ones with the most markets, suq. And he says, وَأَحَبُّ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَسَاجِدُهَا and the most beloved lands to Allah are the ones with many uh, mosques, places of worship. You know, and what's happened in this country, I mean, you can go still in the Midwest and in small towns. They, they had churches on every corner. Now, not because uh, they were so religious, but because there were so many denominations. Right? I mean, like in Muslim countries, you have all these mosques on every corner, but they're all the same Muslims. I mean, they don't have a lot of sect. Whereas you go into small towns, and it's, there's the Methodists, and there's the Baptists, and there's the, uh, the Evangelicals, and there's the Pentecostals, and there's the Catholics, and there's the Lutherans, and there's the Episcopalians, and there's the Mormons. I mean, literally, in one town, you're going to get, and now they have, because so many immigrants recently, they have the Korean Episcopalian, and the Vietnamese Catholic, and the, I mean, it's even more split up. So, alhamdulillah, Allah, you know, saved us from all that nonsense and made us one ummah. And even, you know, we have uh, difference in madhab and things like that, but n no Muslim would not pray in a, in a mosque unless, with the few minority exception of mosques like Islam Temple, which is a mockery of Islam in San Francisco, the Masonic thing, they call it Islam Temple, right, which is just making fun of Islam. Or like Ahmadiyya, where they have absolutely uh, certain things in their that take them out of the fold of Islam, but those are a minority. Um, Ismailiya, those type of things, that's a minority. So, and then the other thing, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu the, the other thing is that he, according to Aisha radiallahu she said, كانت أعماره ديما, his actions were continuous. In other words, he didn't just do things one time or two times. He did things constantly. And that is why it is better to take a few du'a and really practice them before you add. Don't try to do everything all at once. Take a few du'a and make them consistent in your day. And the best thing is you can memorize it in Arabic. If, if, and what you can do initially, if you want even, is take this paper that I gave out. And again, if you can't read the Arabic, that is problematic. Um, because you should at least be able, unless you're a brand new Muslim, 
you should be working seriously on uh, being able to read Arabic. Uh, if you can't read the Arabic, if you cannot read the Arabic, what I would suggest is you get an Arab brother or somebody that knows Arabic well to do a uh, transliteration initially, but don't use that as a crutch. It's just something initially uh, to, to use. And, they, and they'll get sawab, so don't feel shy about asking them because you're actually giving them a reward for teaching you something. So if you look here, I didn't put these in an order. But on the first one, du'a and known, because uh, what's that? Oh, you didn't get any? Shame on you. <laughs> Not on you, on the men. Who was passing them out? Is there, are they all gone? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, we can't, ladies have to do dua as well. <laughs> like in some countries they think the husband just does the Islam for the whole family now, right? Or now it's even worse, grandpa. I mean, <laughs> you know, oh, my grandpa's a falih. You know, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's one man he told me in Tunisia uh, that sin al bulugh is arba'een. He said, like, the age of taklif when you have to do things is 40. I said, no, no, no. It, it's 40 minus 33. <laughs> that's when you start praying. If <laughs> somebody gave it to you wrong, you should pray at age of seven. And then taklif is when you enter into purity. No. So if you look at this, uh, the du'a of Naum, and these are all sahih. This one's in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, that the Prophet used to sleep, al-tajaa, which means to sleep. Um, he used to lie down on his right side. Now that's a very interesting fact, because... Um, what, what happens when you, if you sleep on your right side? Now, this is not Western medicine because they they're not sophisticated enough to recognize stuff like this. But um, it's interesting in, in classical Chinese medicine, uh, they say that you should sleep on your right side, not your left side, because uh, at night the liver purifies the blood, and by sleeping on the, the right side it facilitates the, the movement of the blood, it's easier instead of sleeping on the left side. Now, there are some people that cannot sleep on their left side because it's actually painful to do that. But the Prophet did sleep. You should at least begin your sleep on your left side, and you should not sleep on your stomach because that is the way Shaitan sleeps. Shaitan sleeps on his stomach, and that's a sahih hadith. And so Muslims should not... And if you see something, the Prophet used to get people off their stomach. Um, it's not a good way to sleep. Now, if that's your habit when you're um, sleeping, to turn on your stomach and you're asleep, naturally that's not something you're accountable for. But to start your sleep like that is not um, from the sunnah. And you might find, um, you know, that you've got strange bedfellows, like Shaitan decides to come and spend the night with you or something like that, which would be grossly unfortunate. So this one, Allahumma aslam tu nafsi, and this is, aslam tu nafsi is giving up the self, which is what Islam means, right? Aslam tu nafsi, I've given up myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aslam tu nafsi ilayka, wa fawabtu amri ilayka, and my whole affair, I've given it to you. That's what's called tafweed, wa ufawidu amri ilallah, like giving tafweed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa alja'tu zahri ilayk, and I have put my back, to now I'm giving up my, my back which holds you up. See, your back, your Allah is what holds you up. So you give it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Raghbatan wa rahbatan ilayk. Out of desire and fear of you. Right? And that targhib and tarheeb is all through the sunnah uh, and the Quran. You will see that. There's never an ayah of targhib where Allah is trying to entice us to the Jannah by doing good actions, except that there's an ayah of tarheeb, where Allah warns us of what are the consequences of not doing that. Now that's really important because tarheeb and tarheeb, at one level of human uh, 
consciousness is what motivates most people. That is not the highest motivation. Um, and the highest motivation is entering into the, the level of the abrar, the people of, like Sayyidina Ali, who said, you know, that, لا أريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. Um, the idea of doing things absolutely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which does not mean that you don't lose your fear for awareness of Allah, but that your actions are not determined out of fear or desire. And there are indications in the hadith that some of the Sahaba were at that level. For instance, لا ملجأ ولا منجا منك إلا إليك. Now that's a really important also, that there's no refuge nor place of safety from you except to you. And this is a conscious awareness, again, of where things are coming from, you see. And that's in the Qur'an also, at the end of Surah At-Tawbah, when they say, you know, that they realize that there was no uh, refuge from Allah except to Allah. But that is a level of knowledge. And so this is what it's reminding. So I believe in the book that you have sent down and in the Prophet arsalta, and the Prophet that you have sent فَإِن مِتَّ مِتَّ عَلَى الفطرة. So if uh, I am, you cause me to die, then I die on, uh, on Fitrah. And that should be the last of what the person says when they go to sleep. If they do that, if you, that's the end actually. If you die, you will die on the fitra from the Prophet Now, on the, uh, and before that it says that if you go to your bed, you should do wudu like you do it for prayer. So that's a sunnah to do wudu before you sleep. And that again is a protection from the mist of shaitan. Because shaitan, wudu is a protection, it's virqa. And it's a shield for the mu'min. And la yudawum alayhi illa mu'min. Only mu'minun are constant in their wudu. That's a sign of a mu'min that they're, they're always in wudu. Now some people have trouble keeping wudu. Right? And a lot of times that is diet. You know, and if you have that problem, then that is not a normal condition. And I don't recommend things like my lanta or something like that because that is not dealing with the problem. That's like covering up the problem. The problem is something else. And a lot of times that, those things can be helped because people do have that problem sometimes. And if you get sick, especially after antibiotics, like you destroy all your intestinal flora, the good and the bad flora, and sometimes people, if they take a course of antibiotics, then the flora is so disrupted that they're gaseous all the time. Right? But really, you should be able to go uh, through the uh, day, you know, in a normal condition without having to repeat your wudu too many times. If, if it is a problem that you're doing it, then, uh, then I would seek some uh, advice or counsel about that from somebody that's qualified to do that. Um, because uh, it's really good to, to do that, to keep the wudu. And then if you look at the Dukhul al-Masjid wal khuruj minhu, the Prophet said, إِذَا دَخَرَ أَحَدُكُمْ الْمَسْجِدِ فَلْيُسَلَّمْ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ ثُمَّ لِيَقُولْ So if you go into the masjid, now the sunnah is to enter in with your right foot first, and then you make a dua on the Prophet and you say like, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, or whatever way, there's many different Variation. The p- important thing is that you make a dua for the Prophet ﷺ because it was by him that you were guided into the masjid. And so it's a r- reminder of that, that you're recognizing that he is the source of your guidance um, in this world. And then you say, Allahumma iftah li abwaab rahmatika. Oh Allah, open up for me the doors of your rahmah, which is a beautiful dua because you're entering into the door and asking for the doors of rahmah to be opened up to you, which is what we would expect when we go to the masjid. وَإِذَا خَرَجَ فَلْيَقُولْ And then when you leave in different riwayat, says you go out with your left foot first. And again, this is a conscious act. You see, you're entering in with a conscious إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intention. So you become intentive that your life becomes conscious. And so you enter in with, with the right, you go out with the left foot. 
and then you can Allahumma inni asiruka min fadrika, which is another beautiful thing. So you go in asking for rahma, and part of rahma is maghfira and all the things that are related to the masjid, which we want the rahma of Allah. But when you go out, you ask for fadl of Allah because go into the world. So you go into the realm of provision, and provision is from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these very beautiful meanings, and I'm just, you know, tapping on the surface of these because they're much deeper than, than I'm going into here. And then the one dua is tiqad min al So the dua of waking up. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا آوى إلى فراشه قال بسمك اللهم أحيا وأموت وإذا استيقظ Now this one is easier than the first one. You see that dua النوم that one is the longer one. And this is for uh, those of us who are um, more forgetful or uh, just, I mean, the, that's what, subhanAllah, the Prophet so generous, he gives for the sabiqun and then he gives for the rest of us that are just trying to catch up. And so the first one is for the sabiqun that want the big ajr of doing that. But this other one is a shorter one. It's very easy to learn. Bismika Allahumma ahya wa amut. Oh Allah, in your name I live and I die. And that, that is the dua of going to your bed. And then he dastaiqada, and then if he wakes up, he says, Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'adama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. And praise be to the one who brought us to life after causing us to die. And to him is the nushur, which is when we were raised back up to Allah. To him is the return on the yawm qiyamah. Now this, the next one is the dua of safar which is a beautiful du'a also. And there's a wonderful hadith, and this is getting about the sunnah. There's different types of sunnah. Now, there's a type of sunnah which is, there's a sunnah meaning in the muftalah al-fuqaha wal usuliyin in technical vocabulary of the people of fiqh and usul. And what the sunnah means, it is that thing that the Prophet ﷺ commanded people to do, um, or... Uh, he did and people saw doing it and confirmed it or he saw Sahaba doing it from the virtuous thing and he confirmed it like there's the Prophet ﷺ was doing the prayer and somebody came out of Ruku' and said Rabbana wa lakal hamd hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi and he added it now we can't do that Muslims cannot do that that is a Sahabi who did that and, and had the ilham uh, from Allah and the Prophet ﷺ said when he did that and this is a beautiful meaning about the nature of Sunnah because the Sahaba are part of the revolu rev revelation we shouldn't forget that the Sahaba were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as part of the revelatory process and there was revelation because of things they said because of things they did Omar radiallahu anhu there are several occasions where he actually had an understanding that preceded the revelation and in certain instances where it actually went against the uh, understanding of the Prophet ﷺ. So they were part of revelation. So when he did this, the Prophet confirmed it. And so it becomes a sunnah. Now we do not do that. There are some people, they come out of the ruku' and they say, Rabbana wa lakal hamdu wa shukr. And that does not, that is not wadid. That does not come in the sunnah and we shouldn't do that. Now that does not mean that there are not dua that some of the, um, the ulama or the salihun have written that they actually made themselves and um, they're different they're different types now that is uh, permissible but not in the ibadah mashru'a it's not permissible like we can make dua and ask for things the best thing is to make dua from what the Prophet ﷺ told first the Quran then the Sunnah but also certain duas that some of the Salihun put down as long as they don't have innovation in them or something, in other words, things that are incorrect meaning. So some of the ulama actually made their own uh, hizb or ma'thur, and it would be usually from the Qur'an and the sunnah. And generally those, those are acceptable, um, as long as people don't think that it's mashru'ah, in other words, that it's, it's part of deen. They're just extra things that some of the people did. And generally most ulama, although there's some dissension about that, but most of the ulama agree as long as they're in accordance with the book and the sunnah, then it's permissible to make dua with them. Uh, but the best thing is to do the ones the Prophet did. And once you've learned all of those, 
then you can start looking for other sources. But I guarantee you, you won't ever need to because there's so many from the Sunnah. So this one is on the du'a of safar of traveling when you go out. And there's a hadith Sayyidina Ali got up on his camel and then he said the du'a and then he laughed. And they asked him why he laughed. And he said, because I saw the Prophet say this du'a and then he laughed. And that is, that's like a following the Prophet out of love. That is not a sunnah to laugh when you get into your car or get on a camel. But because the Prophet did it one time, he just wanted to imitate the Prophet and that is perfectly acceptable. And that's, Ibn Omar was like that. He did that also. So this is, Subhana alladhi sakhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahu muqrineen wa inna ila rabbina lamunqaribun. And this is, glory be to the one who has subjugated this thing for it. Now this is beautiful because it says, Subhana alladhi sakhara lana hadha. Glory to the one who has subjugated Hadha. Now Hadha in the Arabic language is called Ism Ishara. It's talking is a pronoun. You don't you don't have a specific thing indicated. So it's whatever it is. Now, this is from actually it's in the Quran this about this, but because Allah makes tashir. But the fact that Allah, that the Prophet didn't say Subhana Ladi Sakhara Hadhi Naqa or Hadha al Ba'ir or I mean it's this is a general Dua for any vehicle you get in that moves. So if you get into an elevator, this is a perfectly applicable hadith. And I saw uh, one sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ali Bel Faqih, who was a Yemeni scholar, that was the first time I heard this dua was in an elevator. And he got in and, and he was blind and we pushed the thing and he said, Subhan alladhi sakhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahu muqarineen wa inna ila rabbinan muqaribun. And it was perfectly in place. Uh, to do that. So you do this when you get into a car because this is dua al-markab, whatever you're riding, which a car is included. And Allah says in the Quran that He created these uh, various creatures like the, the khayl and the bighal, the horse and the donkey, and then created what we don't know, ma la ta'alamun. So indicating in the future there's going to be forms of travel that the Sahaba didn't know about, which we know about now, like airplanes and all these things. So this is also a dua to say on the airplane because Allah is the one making tafkhir, not the engineer who built it or the pilot who's flying it. They're not musakhir. Allah sakhara lahu. He, he subjugated the thing. And if Allah takes that tafkhir away, down it comes, right? I mean, there's no, and that's part of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, it's a recognition of who's in charge. That even though the beast, you have the reins, or the car, you have your key, you're driving down the road, don't ever become deluded and think that you're the one that sakhara lahu. You didn't subjugate, because if Allah wants, He'll blow the radiator out, or do whatever He wants to just remind you that He's the one letting you use that car. And the moment He takes His inayah away, then there's nothing runs anymore, Right? So there's no jinn in the engine making it run. Mm -hmm. That's what they, you know, they used to think, right? That when they saw the, they thought original people were, when they saw these Western technology, they thought it was all jinn. That they had found Suleiman's book or something and had invoked all these jinn and. So, وَإِنَّا إِلَىٰ رَبِّنَا نَمُنْقَرِبُونَ And we are returning to our Lord. Again, it's a reminder of traveling. You can die on your journey. Yeah, and you can die anywhere, but this is a reminder when you go out that you can die on your journey and that you return to Allah. And then, اللهم إنا نسألك في سفرنا هذا البر والتقوى So, we ask you on this journey of ours, Bir and taqwa. Bir is righteousness, to do good things. And bir is every good thing. And taqwa is a guarding awareness of Allah, that you don't go into ma'asi in the journey. Wamin al amri ma tarba. And from action, those things that you're pleased with. Allahumma hawan alayna safarana hada. Oh Allah, make this journey easy for us. What we anna bu'da. And make the, uh, the distance of it shortened. Now, this is an indication about the nature of, because journeys are difficult, but time perception is relative. So you can be on a journey that seems incredibly long, 
And another journey, especially if you have good company and, and, and there's discourse and talking, and journeys can go so fast that you say, wow, how did we get here? You just all of a sudden find, that is impiwa. That's the idea of the shortening of the journey, of making it real. And that doesn't uh, eliminate the possibility of actual, um, some type of physical shortening. And, and I've seen indication of that in traveling, of getting somewhere that the time was, um, you know, it just wasn't, didn't seem physically possible. But Allah alam about that. I mean, there's a hadith in the Sahih that the earth was shortened for a man who was trying to make tawbah to Allah. There was an actual shortening. Now, there's also a hadith at the end of time that the the saqar of the zaman, wal makan, that things will be shortened, times and places. Unfortunately, it's not baraka; it's the opposite. So, in the end of time, people will go on on journeys, and whereas it used to take them a year from Morocco to make the Hajj, now they get on a plane and they're there in a few hours. Right. So that's a sign of the end of time. And speed, right, which is the whole nature of the this modern society. It's all about speed, doing things fast. Like now, 486, and now they have a new one. 586. When are you going to stop? What, at which point is it fast enough for you? And now if you have a 386, which used to be the whiz on the block, and they're all like, God, this thing's so slow. <laughs> I mean, if that is sick, <laughs> because a couple years ago, wow, that's really fast. That's the latest model. You know, and they were throwing their 286 out. Because the 286 was slow. Now 486 is slow. So when's 586 going to be slow? It's already slow. When's the, I don't even know, 1086 or whatever they go. Why they choose the numbers too? Is this Kabbalah or something? Some magical, huh? 586, 486. Nobody has patience anymore. Wait time. Eliminate wait time, is that what it is in computer engineering? What what time are you trying to eliminate? Zero wait state. SubhanAllah. What what's from Shaitan? Al Ajilatum in Shaitan. Speed is from Shaitan. See the little Shepans in there in the 586. This is great, you know, wait till I show them the 686. What's the enemy man al Rahman? Oh, okay. Oh, mashallah. Five minutes to Maghrib. SubhanAllah. See, time went so fast. For me, it went fast. I don't know about you. You're all like, man, when's he going to stop? <laughs> For me, it went fast. هون علينا سفرنا هذا وطوي عنا بعدا اللهم أنت الصاحب في السفر والخليفة في الأهل So Allah, you're my companion. You're the companion in the journey. And you're the one I'm leaving behind, subhanAllah. So his ma'iyah is with you on the journey, but also he's your khalifa at your family. Right? I mean, this, and this is when men used to go on jihad. They didn't go, oh, you know, I don't have a... Allah was the khalifa, you know, in, with the family. For ahli and there's another one for ahli wal mali wal warad, for in the family, the wealth, and the children. So there's different narrations of this. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min wa'tha safar. So seeking refuge in the difficulty of the journey. Wa ka'abat al manzar and bad seeing bad things. Wa su al munqalib fil mali wal ahli and going returning to the family with misfortunes in wealth and in children and those things. So وإذا رجع قارهم النا وزاد فيهن آئبون تائبون عابدون لربنا حامدون. And this is what you say when you're on your way back, that you say the same thing leaving, and then you say returning, making toba, worshiping to our Lord, we're praising. And then this next one that's in there, I, I can't do this because the time's up, but this one is really important, which is صراط الاستخارة. And the Prophet ﷺ used to teach it to كان يعلمون كما يعلمون السورة من القرآن. He used to teach it like he taught a chapter from the Quran. 
And the istikhara, I'll just close this by saying about the istikhara. Istikhara is when you want to do something and you're indecisive about it. In other words, if something is very clear, like if you want to give sadaqa and you're capable of giving sadaqa, in other words, you're not going to uh, break yourself, you know, where you don't have any money to take care of yourself. That that, you don't need to do istikhara. You say it's good to give sadaqa. So there's certain things that you should naturally know that they're clear. The istikhara, the best thing or istikhara is an ambiguous thing. In other words, for getting married, for buying something that is costly. Um, you might not need it, but you might be ambiguous about it, not know if it's from your nafs and you're just pretending to need it or whatever. And so what istikhara does is it is asking Allah to show you. And this is, see, the, you know, one of the things Christians say about Muslims is they don't have an intimate relationship with God. I mean, this is a classic Christian statement about Islam. I've read it in many books. They say, in other words, the God of the Muslims is so far off that, you know, he's not the God of love, even though his name's Al-Wadud, and, uh, and in Kuntum Tahibun Allah, you know, if you love Allah. But that, that's what, they, you find this in the books of, particularly the Pentecostals that don't really like the Muslims that much for some strange reason. And they, and they put this in there. This, the, the dua of istikhara is telling us that yes, Allah does give us guidance directly in our lives. And that's what istikhara is about. It's about seeking direct guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about important things. And I guarantee you, if you do this with really good intention, you, if things will be made clear to you, and it's a protection against going astray in certain matters, particularly important matters. And, and, and people should do the istikhara. If, you, if you're planning on doing something, do istikhara. And the Sahaba did it all the time. And it's a beautiful um, dua. You, you do the two rak'at, you do wudu, you do two rak'at. You can read Qul Ya Yur Kafirun in the first one and Ikhlas Qul Hu Allahu Ahad in the second one. And then you make the dua and you ask Allah, you, asking Allah that his qudra and his knowledge and these things. And, and then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if this in Kanafi Hadar Amr, خير لي ديني ومعاشي وعاقبة أمري and you name the thing if, if in this and if you don't know Arabic Allah understands every language so you can if it's hard for you to do in Arabic you ask in your own tongue the best thing you do is learn the Arabic but if you, if it's, you can do this in your own tongue you just ask Allah if this affair and you name the thing like Zawaj هذه bint or Zawaj هذا fata or ishtara uh, هذا bayt, whatever it is, buying a house, um, getting a new job, uh, getting married, making hijrah, whatever it is. You name the thing and then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it is good for me in my... And look at these things that are mentioned. Fi uh, dini, that's the first and most important thing. Wa ma'ashi, and then the, your livelihood. So deen comes before livelihood, right? Because that's the proper tarti, uh, that's the proper... Um, the way that it should follow. amri And the end affair of what's coming after. وَعَاقِبَةِ أَمْرِ وَعَاجِرِهِ وَآجِرِهِ فَيَسْهِرْهُ لِي Make this thing easy for me. Facilitate it for me. And, and, and asking Allah to do this is the, usually what will happen is uh, and this is what I've heard from from several teachers is that it's oftentimes the first thing that comes uh, to your heart. If you have still doubts about it, and don't, people have weswasa is a problem. That's another thing where people have whisperings, you know, and they're always doubting themselves. That is actually called jahlun bid-deen according to Zarruq, the person's ignorant of their deen and sunnah because weswasa is not, that's from shaitan, it's not from Allah. You're always, oh, am I in wudu, am I not? Did I do it three times? Did I do it two times? That is waswasa, and that's ibtila, and they call it khalal fil aqal, like the intellect is not, it's not healthy. So anyway, if it's not clear to you, then you can do it again. And you can keep doing it until the, the affair gets clear. Some people have very clear dreams. Some people have, somebody will call them on the telephone. I mean, I've heard many different stories and things have happened to me like that where it's just very clear. 
And I made istikhara a few days ago, and I got very clear indication um, about something. So I'm going to end there.